رسول الكريم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم صدق الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so we can cut to the chase. We continue with the untainted lineage of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the greatest man that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had ever sent to this world who came from the greatest family indeed. And have, after having mentioned a little bit about each one of his great grandfathers, like we've been mentioning the last few episodes, couple of episodes, we now come to the father of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whose name we know was Abdullah. And according to Hafidh ibn Hajar al-Asqalaniyu rahimahullah, this most probably has no debate, there is no discussion, there is no difference of opinion as to whether or not he may have had a different name. His name was Abdullah and it makes sense. This was that son, a very special son of Abdul Muttalib from whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bring to this world the greatest of mankind, the chief of all the prophets, Sayyidul Awwalina wal Akhirin, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we find in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well, from amongst the couple of names that are most beloved to Allah, one is Abdullah and the other is Abdul Rahman. Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. And of course, either with this, before this or after this, come the names of the Prophets. والسلام, this is what we were taught in class by the very great, dear, giant scholar of Islam, Shaykh Radaul Haq, Hafidahullah wa sallamahu min jami' al balaya wal fitan. The Grand Mufti, so to say, of South Africa. Nevertheless, so Abdullah is his name. He was that child that was spared. We know from yesterday in episode number three that uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu father Abdullah was the son whose name kept coming up in the draw that was made to see which one of the sons of Abdul Muttalib as he had made a vow to sacrifice one of the ten if Allah would have blessed him with ten. So it was the name of Abdullah that kept coming up whether it was against 10 camels or 20, 30, 40, 50, up to 100 camels. Finally, when it came to 100 camels, we know that's when 100 camels, they were drawn against the name of Abdullah and it was the lot of the 100 camels that were sacrificed. After this, now the next item on the agenda for Abdul Muttalib was to get Abdullah married. And so Abdul Muttalib would go with Abdullah, the father and the son, and they would propose to a woman by the name of Amina, who was the daughter of a man by the name of Wahab bin Abdumanaf. So we can see that in the second generation, his lineage would also meet uh, with that of the great grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. So here we have Amina, the daughter of Wahab, the son of Abdumanaf. Here we have Ab Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim, the son of Abdumanaf. Nevertheless, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam along with his father, excuse me, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's father along with his grandfather, so Abdul Muttalib and his son Abdullah, they would both go to propose to on behalf, of course, of um, of the son, Abdullah, Abdul Muttalib would go and propose to the family of Amina bint Wahab. And at that time, Abdul Muttalib himself would also propose to the daughter of the man under whose care Amina was at that time. So she is the daughter of Wahab. But at that time, she happens to be under the care of the brother of Wahab. So that is a man by the name of Wuhayb bin Abdumanaf. So try to understand this very carefully. Abdul Muttalib takes his son Abdullah to go to propose to Amina. Amina is the daughter of Wahab, but she is under the care at that time of a man by the name of Wuhayb, who was the brother of the uh, father of Amina. Now, Wuhayb has a daughter as well by the name of Hala. 
So Abdul Muttalib would propose to Hala while he is there to propose on behalf of his son to the first cousin of Hala by the name of Amina. So these proposals were both accepted at one and the same time. And in that same uh, perhaps uh, reception, that same gathering, the feast, the rituals of both of these marriages take place. Thus, Abdullah is married to Amina and Abdul Muttalib is then married to at the same time to a woman by the name of Hala. And from this marriage, Abdul Muttalib's marriage to Hala would come Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu, the great uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who was very near and dear to him. The one who was titled Asadullahi wa Asadu Rasuli, perhaps a name that resonates with many of us because it is amongst those names that we often hear quoted during the khutbah for the Friday prayers. So here Abdullah is married to Amina, Abdul Muttalib is married to Hala. Hala would later on with Abdul Muttalib have a child by the name of Hamza. This Hamza is the mother, uh, basically, sorry, is the, uh, mm, uh, the milk brother of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well as the uncle of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because obviously he is the son of Abdul Muttalib who is the grandfather of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu mentions that as Abdul Muttalib and his son Abdullah were on the, on the way to go and propose to Amina for Abdullah, they came across a woman by the name of Fatima bin Timur. This woman, who was a Jewish woman, she was extremely beautiful and she was very well versed. She had a very good knowledge of the Torah and the Injil. So she happens to see Abdullah with her fa with his father Abdul Muttalib while they are on this journey to go and to propose to Amina, who he would later on marry. Now, at that time, Fatima, this Jewish woman, she asked Abdullah. She tried to seduce Abdullah by telling him, "If you come and have an illicit intimacy with me, a relationship." I will give you 100 camels. Abdullah, who was of course a very righteous, pious man, he said a few words at that time to reply to this Jewish woman who was trying to seduce him. She sa he said, أَمَّا الْحَرَامُ فَالْمَمَاتُ دُونَهُ وَالْخِلُّ فَاسْتَبِينَهُ فَكَيْفَ بِالْأَمْرِ الَّذِي تَبْغِينَهُ يَحْمِلْ كَرِيمُ عِرْضَهُ وَدِينَهُ As for you asking me to, to do something that is haram, that is not permissible with you, that is impossible, that is very far-fetched. It's something that I wouldn't even consider, I wouldn't even entertain the thought. That which you're asking me to do with you, this is not going to happen. A man of honor, a noble man, he protects his own honor and he protects his religion. So he gives this answer to this woman and off he goes, he continues the journey. He gets married to Amina. He spends a few days there with Amina. Three days is what is documented and recorded in the books of history and seerah. After spending three days there, when Abdullah and Abdul Muttalib are on the journey back home, she happens to see Abdullah again. And this time she addresses him saying, she says, oh Abdullah, where did you go? Now this isn't any ordinary woman, this was a woman of class. She says, Abdullah, where did you go after you left me a few days ago? He says, I went, we proposed to Amina and I got married to Amina and I spent a few days with Amina. She says, oh, okay, I see. Well, now let me explain my situation to you. I am not an unchaste woman of loose morals. I wasn't trying to seduce you to get you to do anything haram with me. No, no, let me explain myself, Abdullah. Rather, I saw a glow, a nur, the nur of prophethood that was emanating from your face at that time when you were on that journey. And I wanted that, that same, I had this, this longing, this this wish and I couldn't curb this longing, this wish that I had to have that same glow, that same nur, that, that nur, that light that was emanating from your face and it was the light of prophethood. I wanted that it should be transferred into me. This is why I made that proposal to you. Well now it's been transferred into somebody else. How fortunate the woman indeed from whom would come Rasulullah none other than Amina binti Wahab bin Abdul Manaf. 
So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's father Abdullah is married. After this, he would then go on a journey. He goes on a journey for business purposes. He goes perhaps to Syria as is recorded and documented. On his route, on his journey back from Syria, he falls sick. Abdullah, the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he falls sick. And when he falls sick, he doesn't manage to make it with the rest of the entourage or the caravan back to Mecca to Al-Mukarrama. Instead, he decides to stay in Medina to Al-Munawwara to spend his time with some of his maternal ancestors who were from Banu Najjar. Now, the mother of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Amina, she was from the Banu Zuhra clan or tribe, which was also very, very uh, prominent. Nevertheless, Abdullah on his journey back doesn't make it to Mecca. He stops in Medina to Munawwara. When he stops in Medina to Munawwara, the journey of the caravan continues until they make it to Mecca. And he stops there to spend some time with Banu Najjar in Medina to Munawwara. When the caravan reaches Mecca to Mukarrama, Abdul Muttalib inquires of the whereabouts of his son, who was so dear and beloved to him, Abdullah. And he is informed that on the journey back from Syria, he falls sick. And he wasn't able to make it the rest of the journey with us. Thus, we decided to keep him to spend some time with his maternal ancestors in Medina to Munawwara. When Abdul Muttalib hears that he is sick, he at once dispatches his eldest son by the name of Harith the one with whom he was digging and shoveling to find out and seek out the well of Zamzam. He dispatches Haris to go to Medina to Munawwara at once and find out the condition of his beloved Abdullah. When Harith comes there after some time, he finds that Abdullah, he has left the world. He had been sick for about a month and he finally had breathed his last. And there in the house of Nabigha in Medina al Munawwara, he was buried. When Harith sees this, he has to go back to Mecca al Mukarrama to inform his father Abdul Muttalib. It wasn't easy. Abdul Muttalib, the entire family, and everyone was very dejected and indescribable sorrow was felt by every single one of them for the loss that they had incurred. According to Allama Alai or Hafid ibn Ajr Asqalani rahimahumullah, both of them, Abdullah was probably only aged 18 at this time. There are different narrations, some said 25, some said 28, or even 30. But the most, the most reliable probably is that he was 18 years old at the time when he left this world. And when he's left this world, the Prophet ﷺ is still in the womb of his mother, Amina. It begins from there. He would come into this world as an orphan. Allahu Akbar. The greatest human being to ever set foot on this world would come into this world as an orphan. So nevertheless, about 50 days, 55 days before Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi comes into this world, there's also another very huge incident that takes place. And this incident, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions this in the Holy Quran. As a matter of fact, one of the smaller chapters towards the end of the Holy Quran, perhaps chapter number 106, if I'm not mistaken, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Chapter 106, Li'ila fi Quraysh. In it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this incident. This incident takes place about 50 or 55 days, just under a month, before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa comes into this world. And what is the incident? It is the story of Abraha and the elephants. So Abraha was the governor of Yemen. And this governor of Yemen was appointed by the emperor of Ethiopia, Abyssinia, Habasha, by the name of Najashi, Negus. And Abaraha, he had seen, to try to tell you the story in a nutshell, he had seen that the people of Arabia, the people of Mecca namely, they were very fond of making tawaf of the Ka'batullah his Sharifa. This was a practice even before Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi came into this, into this world. They would make tawaf of the Kaaba and they held the Kaaba in very high esteem. And so they would make tawaf around the Kaaba. 
And Abraha, based in Yemen, he didn't like this. So what he wanted to do and what he decided to do is that he decided to build a very beautiful, wonderfully looking structure, a church in the capital Sana'a in Yemen itself. And he wanted that these Arabs who were making tawaf of the Kaaba should perhaps leave the simple Kaaba. The Kaaba was so simple in its design and its infra infrastructure and they should start performing tawaf of the church that he had, perf that he had designed and he had made and he had built inside of the capital Sana'a. Now, after designing, after building this church in Sana'a, a man, particularly from the tribe of Kenana, he was offended by the fact that he had, Abura had made something like this for himself and expected people to start making tawaf of this, whereas they already had the Kaaba and held it in very high esteem. This man defaced the Kaaba by committing stool inside of the Kaaba on one occasion. One narration goes like this, while the other mentioned in the books of history and seerah is that some individuals came, a few youngsters, and in the precincts of the Kaaba, they lit a little fire. And a wind, a gust of wind came and picked up wonder, one of the smoldering embers of the fire and lobbed it inside of the vicinity or inside of the perhaps the church itself. And there and then the church was lit ablaze and set on fire and ultimately it was reduced to ashes. When Abraha saw this, when he was informed of this, when he knew of this, with a fury, a rage, he said, I will not stop and I will not rest until I destroy the Kaaba to ruins just as this church of mine has been burnt to ashes. Abraha sets out with an army. And this army that he sets out with is extremely mighty, powerful, and strong. And in this army, he's got an army of elephants as well. So they begin to march. And as they are marching, they come across the livestock belonging to some of the people of Mecca that happened to be grazing out in the open. They went and they took hold, they snatched or they seized the property of the people of Mecca and included in that livestock, in that property that they had usurped, they had stolen basically, was 200 camels that belonged to the grandfather of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdul Muttalib. After doing this, Abdul Muttalib was informed very calmly he told the people of Mecca that you have nothing to worry about. You people should leave Mecca, go and take shelter inside of the mountains and leave Mecca. Nobody will be able to cause any harm to the Ka'batullah al-Sharifa. And so he went and paid a visit to Abraha. And before reaching Abraha, he sent out a messenger to go inform Abraha that I am coming to speak to him. And so when Abraha was informed that Abdul Muttalib is coming to address him, he decided to welcome him very warmly. Now, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Rasulullah ﷺ, was an individual whom Allah had blessed immensely. Allah had blessed him with this, with this majesty, with this eminence, with this dignity, with this, with this awe that anybody who saw him, they were just amazed. Anybody who saw Abdul Muttalib, they were spellbound at the looks, the dignity, and how handsome Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made him. Naturally, when Abraha saw that Abdul Muttalib had come, he didn't find it appropriate to allow him to sit on the very same throne as himself, but at the same time, he was taken aback by the looks, by the awe and the eminence of this individual. So he decided to come down from his throne to welcome him. Now he begins, Abdul Muttalib begins to address Abraha. And he says to his eminence, he says, Abraha, your army, they have taken that which belongs to me. 200 camels which are mine have been looted by your army. I am here to request that those camels be returned to me. Abraha was shocked. He was lost for words. He said, this is rather very strange. 
I am about to come to destroy that which is the most important of perhaps all the salient features of the religion of your forefathers, the Kaaba. I am about to come to destroy your Kaaba. And of all the things in the world, you haven't even made mention of it. You're worried about your camel. And then there's this moment of silence. And then Abdul Muttalib replies, he says, I am the owner of the camels. Therefore, I have come to request that the camels be given to me, returned to me. As for the Kaaba, there's somebody who is the caretaker and the master of the Kaaba. He will take care of the Kaaba himself. The camels belong to me. I want that they be returned. The Kaaba belongs to Allah. Allah will protect and take care of his Kaaba. Abra was lost for words. He says, release the camels to him. Let the camels be given back to their owner. Abdul Muttalib returns his camels. And being a man of his generosity, of his grace, of his nobility, he offers in sacrifice to the Ka'batullah all 200 of the camels. He returns to the people of Mecca and he tells all of them, we will go up the mountain too. And when we go up the mountain, he has a few individuals with him who will begin to cry as he implores Allah. And he begins making dua and these people with him, they begin to cry unto Allah. And this is all the while Abraha and his army of ele ele elephants, they are out to destroy the Kaaba and they continue to come closer and closer. And here you have Abdul Muttalib sitting at the top of the mountain making dua to Allah. Allahumma inna al-mar'u yamna'u rihala, inna al-mar'a yamna'u rahlahu famna'u rihalaka, la yaslibanna. وَانْصُرْ عَلَىٰ آلِ الصَّلِئِبِ وَعَابِدِيهِ الْيَوْمَ آلِكْ آلَكَ لَا يَغْلِبَنَّ صَلِيبُهُمْ وَمَحِيلُهُمْ أَبَدًا مِحَالَكَ And then he says a few other words جَرُّوا جَمِيعَ بِلَادِهِمْ وَالْفِيلَ كَيْ يَسْبُوا عِيَالَكَ مَدَوْ حِمَاكَ بِكَيْدِهِمْ جَهْلًا وَمَا رَقَبُوا جَلَالَكَ These are the words of Abdul Muttalib. He says, oh Allah, a man protects his own home. The Kaaba is your house, so oh Allah, we beg you to protect your house. And don't let the people of their cross, the people of the cross, don't let their plans, their schemes, and their crosses overcome and overpower your, your scheme, O oh Allah. And these people have brought their forces and their might with them and their elephants with them to try to take away and capture those people who are yours, O oh Allah. These people don't know what they are about to go up against. They are ignorant of the fact that they are about to go up against someone, you, O oh Allah, who is almighty. Makes this dua to Allah. And those around him are crying. And Abraha with his army continues to draw nearer and nearer to the Kaaba. And as he gets very close, this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders very small birds with stones inside of their beaks and inside of their claws to rain these stones over the entire army of Abraha. They would come through their heads and fatally out the bottom and that was it. Anybody who was struck by any one of these stones immediately, instantly met his end and they were destroyed. And this happened with every single one of the army of Abraha. And as for him himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tried him and tested him with a pox-like condition, as a result of which all of his limbs began to melt away and sever and fall off of his body. This was the condition which was met by Abraha, who wanted to, with his evil intent and evil and uh, evil plan to destroy the Kaaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him taste his evil end. And then after his limbs began to sever from his body, this continued until finally his chest was ripped open and his heart pumped out. And like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَقُطِعَ دَابِرُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And the roots, the, the evil of these people, they were uprooted. All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the most magnificent or remarkable events that takes place 
just about two months before Rasulullah comes into this world. And what now would be the auspicious birth of Rasulullah For this, inshallah, you stay tuned and tomorrow we will continue. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.